Hello everyone, my name is Nate Ferguson, and today we are talking about Loggers 101, how to make the crispy logger. It's been far too long since I've done one of these things, so I'm excited for today. So, before we start off with loggers, we're going to go through uh, what our desired goal is, so to speak. So, everyone can see the two different glasses in front of us, and I hope we can all objectively say, you know, looking at these two, that the one on the left is absolutely the one we're looking for. That's the one we're trying to, that's when we're trying to, trying to produce. That is the goal. We want it to be clear, crisp, nice foam on it. Looks very visually appealing. While the one on the right, although it is yellow and looks light, it has no foam, it looks lifeless, listless. This is one of the things that we unfortunately see with, you know, lager brewers far too often. One of the things that we're going to help you solve today with what we're going to talk about. Now, it's not just light beers. It can also be dark beers, dark beer lagers. What we have here at the left-hand side, again, wonderful D Munich-style Dunkel or something like that. Wonderful rocky foam on top of the thing, or not on the right. Now, there's a lot of different factors for, for this, lots of different things that can factor into it. So today, we're going to talk about the basics. We're just going over the basic principles for making lagers. If this is interested, interesting for you, stick around. You're going to learn a lot. So with that, We'll jump in. Now, before we get started on this topic, I like to kind of frame it a little bit because one of the things that I find a lot of brewers do is, is fall into this little trap here. So let's think. So first off, let's dig into this main issue. So here's a question. How many different types of ales are there? Now, my kind of sounds like a silly question. We have English style pale ales, American style pale ales, English, uh, Belgian style ales, doubles, triples, quads, things like that. Belgian golden strongs. We have some of the French style ales, saisons. You can go to Kvikes. There's tons. Now, here's the next question. Do we make them all the same? Now, I hope your answer here is no. The tools, techniques, methods that we use to make, say, an English style ale, ingredients especially, uh, versus a Saison, versus a Kvike, versus even an Alt or a Kolsch, or something like that. Very, very different. Very different. But for some reason, almost, I say everyone, but a lot of brewers think that we make all lagers the same way. And one of the things that I'm hoping to dispel today is this fact that no. Different lagers, just like different ales, require different tools and techniques and methods in order to be executed properly. So, now this is not a perfect breakdown, this is not a perfect execution or you know, categorization of it, but I like to kind of use this little rough breakdown of it. We're going to be breaking that into, down into kind of two different groups. We have our North American, these are things like our, you know, your Coors Lights, your MGDs, Coronas, Labatt Blues, Molson Canadian, or Canadian, sorry. Uh, and then our European, these are things that are Czech style lagers, German style lagers, you know, they have different flavor profiles and the way in which those flavor profiles are produced has a lot to do with the methods lot. So just some kind of common styles. North American ones would be North American style light lager, premium lager, Mexican lager, steam beer to a certain degree, Italian pilsner. I always just kind of think of like a dry hop light lager. I, I know it's not always right, but that's usually how it comes out, at least in the ones I've tried. Well, our, the continental ones are Munich houses, Vienna lagers, Czech lagers, Czech pilsners, much more dark depth of flavor, much more delicate tones, you know, very different when it comes to the emphasis. Now, on top of all of this, this topic is massive. You know, we, we could spend hours and hours, and I, I have done so with, uh, with a handful of my students, gone hours and hours on how to make different types of lagers. So we're not going to go into the details today. If you guys want that, let us know. We'll produce more content on it. Uh, but we're going to be going over kind of the, the basic and kind of most asked questions regarding lagers. Now, the one thing I do want to try to emphasize this is... Um, the need for this to be cost effective. Um, you know, I talked to a few different brewers and we've had them you know, go like, oh, I want to, I want to make a traditional style uh, Czech style Pilsner. I want it to take us 10 weeks to produce. And that, that can be financially not non-viable. And that's when you need to keep in mind when you start looking at this. Throughput is key. You really have to make sure you're answering the question as to how this is going to fit in your portfolio. If you have to scale this thing up, how do you actually execute it? How do you actually make sure it doesn't, you know, you have the tank space for it. You have the ability to do this. A few different ways to do it, but it's, it's there. Now, the other part that's really unfortunate for loggers, and this is just how the product is positioned in the marketplace, at least especially up here in, North, in, uh, in Ontario, Canada, is that it loggers are very technical brews. They're not beers that, you know, you can just kind of homebrew or throw you know, a lack of emphasis and care on and have it turn out. 
um, if you want to be, be good. They have, they are kind of meticulous. They're technical. But the beer is a commodity. You can't charge the same amount you charge for, say, a mixed ferment, sour, barrel-aged, whatever it is. Um, it's a commodity. It has a certain kind of price point. There's enough. There's a lot of competition associated with it. So you got to make sure you're doing this. These are sometimes a labor of love. Maybe they don't get the respect it, be, it is. Just sort of the respect it deserves. Just you got to keep these things in mind. You can't charge ten bucks a pint. Now, also as an industry, I might get some hate on this one. I, I think as a, as a role, we have to get better for making lagers when it comes to the craft kind of small micro you know, producers. And I say this from a place that I want to help. Um, you know, our businesses are becoming much more competitive. Patrons' tolerance for poor quality loggers is becoming much more, is much lower. You know, it's, their tolerance is decreasing. I think you owe it to yourselves and to your customers to improve the quality of your loggers. Um, you know, I want us to all to do this, and I think together we can help you help you get there. Now, this was this was, whole talk was kind of spurred on at a conference I was at a few months ago. Um, where they had about 13 different loggers available for you know, sampling, and like 75% of them had some sort of serious off flavor to them. It wasn't good. Uh, you know, and these are a lot of people who just didn't know. They just weren't. They didn't know how to fix the things. So they weren't asking for help. Please ask for help. If you're here, we're here for you guys. If you need help, please ask. Now, my opinion on the state of loggers, uh, and it was, wouldn't be an escarpment yeast uh, presentation if <laughs> we didn't mention yeast lightning. Um, is that I think a lot of the time, lo a lot of lagers will be improved if you add some sort of high quality yeast nutrient to it. Now, yeast lightning is a, I'm biased, it's a great way to do this. Um, now, the main reason for it is we'll be on the next slide, but yeast lightning or some sort of a better yeast nutrient will help. Now, if you do want to go with another product, if you're reading this, you can't get access to our, to yeast lightning, or you just, you know, for some reason liked our content, but don't want to order things from it. It's all good. We're just here to help. If I didn't have access to yeast lightning, I'd be buying Servomyces from Lalamond. I think that stuff's also very good. It's not as good as ours, but I think that that product is very good as well. So if you don't, if you if you want to improve your loggers, but you don't want to help out, or you don't want to be a, a part of us, it's all good. I would buy that one. But I hope you do. Hope you find this useful. Now, why do I say yeast nutrient is important? Well, let's run through some of the common off flavors we see associated with loggers. Then I'd say the four main ones we see are acetaldehyde, sulfur, fusels, and diacetyl. How does the yeast nutrient help this? Quite simply, acetaldehyde is mainly due to uh, is mainly associated with two main nutrient deficiencies: zinc and oxygen. Oxygen we can fix and fix with more aeration. Zinc is almost nearly impossible, and yeast sorry yeast lightning has lots of zinc in it, so it's going to help you remove the, that acetaldehyde. If you want more information on, on almost all of these, you can find them on our blog, by the way, or our knowledge base. Sulfur is a, is a, is a lack of use of certain amino acids, mainly cysteine and methionine, which yeast nutrients have. Fusel alcohols is usually due to having too much or too little fan, uh, and a lack, lack of wort aer aeration, and often a lack of trace nutrients. Yeast nutrients can help. And diacetyl is often too little fan, or low oxygen levels. Again, yeast nutrient will help. Yeast lightning will help you out with this. A lot of these things can help you solve. So if you're doing number one thing, or the first thing I recommend you do if you're trying to improve the year logger game, start adding some yeast nutrient. It's going to do a lot of the heavy lifting. But then we can get into the rest. So we're going to break today's talk down into roughly three general zones. We're going to basic principles of making loggers, what to do, common questions about making certain loggers, why we do these things, and then making different types of loggers. You know, how do we focus on making North American versus continental? We're not going to get further into that. If you want to learn more about those things, let us know. We'll make them. But overall, we're hoping to have a good time. So let's go. Let's dig in. So if you just want to go to the T TLDR, you know, most people have an attention span of about, you know, up to 10 minutes. So we're just before that 10 minute point. Here's your TLDR. Boil the beer for 90 minutes. That's going to get rid of almost all your DMS issues. Make sure the kettle lid is off as well if you, if you can. Pits lots of yeast. 1.5 to 2.25 at times your normal pitch rate for an ale. Knock the pH down a little bit. Add a bit more acetic acid, sorry, a little bit more uh, lactic acid, not acetic acid. A little bit of lactic acid or phosphoric acid to it. Lager yeasts do not acidify their media. It makes the beer taste kind of flabby and uh, coating, not in a good way. Ferment cold. At least start cold. Start at 10 degrees Celsius. We'll talk about it more and more later. Cold condition the beer for a bit. You need to lager it. That's where the name comes from. They're lagers. Cold conditioned beer. For a decent duration. And maybe filter it. That's your TLDR. Now I hope you're all, if you're here, are asking the next question. Why? 
and that's what we're going to answer more in, more in. So the first is, why should you boil for 90 minutes? Now, I just want to point this out. This DMS Removal Services, this is a moving company that just has a wonderful name for our industry. It's very niche. I've reached out to them. They're going to be putting this, in thing, this thing in here, which is kind of fun. So why do we boil for 90 minutes? We do this to remove DMS or dimethyl sulfide. Uh, that this is a substance that is broken down and often smells like canned corn. If you're not sure what DMS smells like, go to your grocery store, get a can of canned corn, open it, stick your nose in. That's DMS. Now, it is a precursor. So it's precursor SMM or S-methylmethionine is extracted from the grain. This is naturally occurring. You can't get rid of it. It's not like you can choose different greens that won't have it. It's going to have it. Now, when these greens are kilned, this SMM will break down into DMS which will then flash off the grain. Now, the issue with, malt, with Pilsner malt, the main malts used to make lagers, is that the Pilsner malt is very lightly kilned, which means more of this substance is retained in, the, in your initial base ingredients. This is why when it comes to beers like English-style pale ales or even some cases of North American-style two-row, you don't have to do this. If you're using Pilsner malt, you should be boiling for at least 90 minutes. If you're using North American two-row uh, or even English-style base like Thomas Fawcett, 90 minutes is not required. May have some benefits, but not required. Now, if you want to see what the impact is going to be, we will see, you know, as the evaporation rate increases, we boil it for longer, we will see some of these sulfitic tones, some of these grassy tones start flashing off, which is what we're looking for. It's absolutely what we're it's why we're boiling for this longer period of time. Now, we know that DMS flash off is, is kind of percentage based. So here's a rough idea as to how it works. So if we boil the wort for 40 minutes, we're going to be losing about 50% of our initial amount of DMS, only about half. If we go to 60, we're going to lose about 64.7, 90 minutes, about 80%. It's never going to be zero. You're never going to reach zero, zero percent. But the longer you boil, the less DMS there's going to be. Now, there's some other quirks when it comes to DMS boiling, especially when it comes to brew house design. If you if you have a condensate stack that's poorly engineered where the DMS can actually condense on the, on the stack and then fall back into the wort, that's not going to help. Boiling for longer will reduce it further, but you have a mechanical disadvantage here where it's, it's not, you had to change your brew house layout in order to fix this fully. Uh, but for most modern brew houses, that's not a problem. It's just something that's worth noting. So yeah, boil the wort for a long period of time. Next part, acidify your wort more than normal. Now the reason for this is just a quirk of lager yeast. So this is a part of a presentation we gave about ooh, two years, three ago, three years ago, uh, called the great T the TFE test ferment experiment. Uh, you can find a YouTube video on that, uh, where we looked at you know a handful of I think forty or so different yeast strains we 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 commonly sell. And we looked at a lot of the properties, and one of them is the final pH. Now, why do we care about final beer pH? The reason for this is this: if our pH is too high, meaning not acidic enough, the beer tastes flabby dull. It kind of coats the mouth, not in a pleasant way. It, it's, it's, it's slick in many cases. Now, these are not things that we want in a nice, light, crispy lager. These aren't things we're, we're going for. So a lower, help, a lower beer pH helps keep these beers bright, light, clean, all that stuff. Now, unfortunately, unlike a lot of our Saccharomyces cerevisiae or ale yeasts, Lager yeasts don't produce that much acid. You notice here that almost all you know, lager yeasts are on the upper end when it comes to pH. They're on the higher end. There you go, higher end when it comes to the pH. So we need to help them out. We have to add a bit more acid for them. Now, historically, if you want to go and maintain Reinheitsgebot and all that stuff, Reinheitsgebot, uh, someone can probably correct me on that. Um, this is where things like a sour goot tank or adding lactic acid malt, acid, you know, acid malts from Weyermann or things like that would be used, could be used. You don't have to use phosphoric acid or lactic acid concentrates. You can use these other acid ingredients in order to provide more. But try to add a bit more. It's going to help the beer become lighter, crisper, drier, a bit tartar, lighter on the palate. All good things when making lagers. And here's just the, uh, the data for it. If you want to pause the video now and take a look at it, you can. Now, the next part is pitching lots of yeast. Now, this part might be a little controversial, and that's fine, but pitching is, it is one of the most multivariable things I know of, uh, especially when it comes to, the, to comes to beer manufacturing. So, pitch rate is, is based on initial cell health, the initial gravity of the media, uh, in this case, the, the beer, uh, the wort, the DO content of the wort to the cells, 
fan and vitamin concentration, desired ester profile. You can play with this one. That's why there's a range. Now, in general, you want to pitch at least 50% more, which is about 1.5x. Um, but some, some breweries go up to 3. Some breweries you know, go a bit lower than 1.5. It's a range. you got to play with this one because it's going to be dependent on all of these other variables associated with your ferment. <coughs> now, to give you a little bit of background on this, well, maybe some, some ideas, here is one data set. So what we have here is a pitch rate. So that as the pitch rate increases, increases, we start seeing the time for half gravity. There we go. Decrease. So as we increase more cells, obviously the fermentation rate slows down, but the time to get half gravity grows. Now, the other part here that it's very interesting to see is that as we add more cells, we start seeing our yeast growth increase and then some and then plummet down. Now, in general, in general, again, every facility is going to have their own desired you know, sweet spot. The sweet spot is you're looking somewhere in this zone right here right around here. We want there to be some yeast growth. Yeast growth is going to produce some flavor profiles, some positive, some negative. Too little yeast growth can, can produce a lot of negative flavors associated with the wort. Too much can also produce some negative flavors. Too slow of a fermentation means a certain flavor, certain flavor compounds won't flash off. Too slow of a fermentation means they won't be produced and they'll be retained. It's a balancing act. It's all trade-offs. So you got to kind of play with it. you got to find the sweet spot for what it is that you're trying to work with. Now, to further illust illustrate you know, this idea, what we're looking at here is a three-dimensional variable graph. So if you want to pause, try to wrap your head around it a little bit. It's going to take some time. I would recommend it. It's one of my favorite, image, favorite graphs when it comes to brewing, by the way. Um, we have here that the impact of dissolved oxygen and PPM and pitch rate. And what we're looking for is the time to half gravity. So what is this showing us? Well, it's showing us that as we increase our pitch rate, the time to reach half gravity decreases, which makes sense. If we have twice as many workers, job gets done twice as fast. Same thing here. We have twice as many cells, beer ferments faster. What also happens is that as we increase our wort aeration with the same pitch rate, our fermentation times also go faster, which is very neat. We can have a lower pitch rate with a super high aeration rate and still ferment quite quickly. We can, if you want to try to, you know, get that sweet spot or make our fermentations run at a certain rate, we can either increase more cells, we can increase more oxygen in order to get the fermentation rate we're looking for. Now this says nothing about flavor compound production. This says nothing about trace nutrient availability. If we wanted to add a fourth variable on this and it had like, you know, yeast nutrient additions, that would probably have a similar correlation. It's multivariable. You got to play with it. You got to find what works for you and your facility. So yeah. Adding more yeast is going to give you a cleaner, faster, and healthier fermentations. Too much yeast, too little yeast growth, more off flavors. There's a Goldilocks effect here. Too hot or too cold, you want it to be right in the middle and just and be just right. I wish there was a much cleaner, simpler, exactly do this methodology for this, but there isn't, unfortunately. If you're asking for me where to start, I'd recommend it starting with 2x your yeast cell pitch and work from there. If you want to quirk, you know, tweak it one way or the other, it's a good middle point. And the last one, one of the last ones to talk about is fermenting cold. I put this in here mainly because for my daughter, because Frozen is currently her favorite movie. She just turned three. Uh, so yeah, cold fermentations are are used to util, are utilized to ferment maybe two things, mainly two things. One is a decrease in flavor compound production. This has some positives and negatives. Some flavor compounds are positive. Some flavor compounds are not. They're negative. That's fine. And the second one is to increase sulfur character. Now again. Much like other flavor compounds, sulfur can be good and sulfur can also be bad. It's a balancing act. So how do we ferment cold? And there's lots of different ways. So we're going to run through some of the, I'd say, classic versions of this. So a traditional lager beer fermentation would be start and hold at six. And that's it. You just hold at six. Very classic. You can also start at six and increase two to three degrees Celsius after two to three days pretty common. You can start and hold at 10. Pretty common. Um, a modern version would be something like this. Start between 10 to 20 degrees Celsius, increase temperature a few degrees near the end of fermentation. Sometimes do this under pressure. 
That'd be more akin to a North American style light lager, where the left hand side here would be more akin to a European style continental pilsner. It depends. Uh, here are a few different other examples. Here are six different fermentation regimes that you can walk through and test out if you desire uh, that are used for different lagers around the world. If you want us to dig into these and go kind of case by case, we can. Let us know. We can go through it. It's, a, it's kind of a fun topic. But what I do want to emphasize is this. And this, is, uh, this has a bunch of different implications to it. And I believe this was a data set that was produced by Brewlosophy, which I, was actually one of the better ones I've, I've ever read, read from them. I think I've been critical of them a little bit in the past, but this one was, this one was very good. Um, what we have here are the timeline for a logger, log, uh, Czech lager fermentations uh, based on a traditional lager methodology. And then a what I would describe as a modern North American style lager manufacturing where you do a free rise, uh, you know, you ferment, I think they cast out at 10 degrees Celsius here, let it free rise up near the end of fermentation, and then did a very quick lagering on it. I just want to take a look at the, the total number of days required for manufacturing for this. So if you look at the, the traditional method, we're looking at 55 roughly days, which is about a month and a half. That is a large amount of time dedicated for the baking of a single batch of beer. Where the opposite, the, I'd say, North American style light lager methodology is about 15 days, or about a third of the time required to manufacture this product. One of these methods is much more cost effective. One of them is much more lucrative. And unfortunately, it is not the traditional lager method. There are things we can do to help speed up this lager manufacturing and help hopefully get to a middle point between the two. But that is a topic for a different presentation. So... Why should you ferment cold? Or, or why should you cold condition your lager? Sorry. Now, lager is traditionally started about 5 degrees Celsius and allowed to slowly decrease to 0 degrees Celsius. This is a very European methodology. Now, the beer will then stay at 0 for a few weeks to months until the desired traits of the product are achieved. Now, there's a few things that we're trying to do here. We're trying to achieve this, this, this cold conditioning. And I'm going to take a sidestep here and recommend that whenever you're doing something when it comes to any style of beer you're making, always try to ask yourself, why are you doing this and what flavor profile are you trying to achieve with this methodology? Because if you don't ask yourself that, you might be wasting time, money, or resources of some way, shape, or form. So the first thing we're trying to do is adjust carbonation. Now, if you're following German purity laws and you can't force carbonate the product, you're actually trying to maintain or develop a more CO2, some more carbonation through a slow fermentation in the product. That's needed. Um, you're also trying to develop a filterable chill haze, which we can talk about, we'll talk about more later, but as the beer sits cold, much like if we have a beer that sits cold in you know, any, any environment, it can sometimes produce a chill haze, which makes, if the chill haze is already formed, it's easier to filter out, or it just, with these beers, settle out. And finally, we're looking for some final flavor development. Highly correlated to the other two, but we'll talk about that in a second. Now, there are also some flavor changes that occur during uh, during lagering. These changes are mainly CO2 stripping of volatiles, mainly acetaldehyde and H2S. Now, when it comes to any flavor compound, we're, we're trying to eat, we can either, we can control its uh, presence in the final beer by either reducing its production or stripping more of it out. If we don't have any acetaldehyde or sulfur compounds that we have to get rid of, this portion of lager manufacturing is redundant. We're also trying to clean up diacetyl. Now at these colder temperatures, it is going to be slower. And just like this, the, the previous line, if there's no diacetyl to clean up, we don't have to do this. And precipitate out bitter compounds, especially IB, uh, bound IBUs, to the, sorry, IBUs bound to the outside of yeast cells. Um, this is any sort of yeast cells that, fell, that fall out of suspension. There are IBUs coating the outside of those yeast cells, which will taste bitter to the palate. One of the reasons why Keller beers or unfiltered lagers do taste more bitter. But we can filter those out. So there are ways that we can help accelerate, you know, remove some of the time required for these. But again, these are really getting into it. It's a different talk. So it's the basic principles. Those are the what to do, why we do it a little bit. We're now going to dig into some common questions about making loggers or why we do certain, certain things. Now, a little bit about this section. Everything we're going to talk about here is a bit of a judgment call. There is no perfect solution. There are only different trade-offs. A common uh, quote I keep on coming across is from a guy named Thomas Sowell. Um, there are no solutions, only trade-offs. It's a great summary of this next session. Section. It's kind of like a choose-your-own-adventure. 
I'm not saying you should do any one of these two things. I just want to explain why some people may do one or may not do one, may not do something. So with that, let's jump in. Consider the following. So decoction mashing, a very common technique that we see associated with European style manufacturing of lagers. Why should we do it? Why would one want to do this thing? So for those who don't know, decoction mashing is a very labor intensive process where you are pulling grains and liquid out of your mash tun, boiling it, and then reintroducing it back into your mash tun. It's very laborious. Historically, this was done for consistency and from lack of uh, large scale implements for boiling liquids. This has kind of some mechanical limitations for you know, ma beer manufacturing, the Wayback Machine. But the, the benefits of this, me of this methodology are usually thought to be flavor development, mainly due to Maillard reactions or kind of caramelization reactions that we associate with give us more toffee, bit, bready, biscuity tones inside of the wort or in the finished beer. Increased fermentability because this is a much longer mash rest system. It takes several hours to complete, not just a standard 60 or 90 minute mash. Um, this is especially useful if we are working with low quality malts, which is not really a thing that we have to worry about anymore. We also get more starch gelatinization because we're boiling the grains, more of that in a second, and also arguably some reduced off flavor production, but that's mainly anecdotes. So is it necessary? It's debatable. Now, if you were asking me, should I do a decoction mash on my double New England IPA, my double NEPA? No, 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 you're not going to have a benefit of it there is going to be almost no benefit to that method to adding that technique because you are adding a very delicate, nuanced flavor with decoction mashing, and you're going to be completely covering it up with hops. It's not, it's not going to have an impact. Decoction mashing is, is a slight increase. You know, it's slight caramel, slight sweet aromas, a little bit of bread, bread biscuit toffee tones. It's not, you know, it, it's, it's refined chisels, not sledgehammers. And it comes to a flavor standpoint. Now, if you're a small scale operation, there are some serious health and, self, health and safety issues associated with this uh, in those if you're DIYing it, especially if you're doing this at home. So if you don't have equipment designed for this, I'm going to strongly encourage you not to do this. Strongly encourage you not to do this. Uh, and for those who want to kind of, you know, if you want to dig into what the, what's associated with the mash system or how long it takes, this is what a standard triple decoction type system, uh, type mash will look like. And you can notice that the mash here is over three hours long a long time. So one of the benefits of this method I mentioned al already is, you know, we get increased in gelatinization. Now, one of the things that a lot of brewers can take advantage of here is to do multiple mash rests. And this is kind of a, a middle point between the two. If I, if I were, you know, looking to increase to get some of the tones and some of the properties associated with this without having to go through all the rigmarole and system modifications and capital expenditures associated with getting the decoction system up. Most people here probably, who are watching this probably have steam jackets on their mash tub. They could probably, you can probably pull this off already. So why would we want to do multiple mash rests? Well, Pilsner malt is under modified, which means it has a low enzyme content, a high protein content, and a higher starch content than some of the, some of the English style grains or even North American style grains. These rests, namely the protein rest and protease rest, will help pull out more of the compounds in the grains. They'll help pull out more proteins, break down more proteins, give us more extract, give more body and mouthful and texture to the beer. And one of the ways this, this occurs is through for, um, enhanced gelatinization of the starch granule. Now what we have here, this is not a barley kernel. This is actually a starch granule present inside of every single starch you consume, whether it be corn, rice, potatoes, uh, whatever it may be. All the starches are located in these nice little you know, bundles with layers, like onions or ogre. And how they work is that when we have our starches initially, so we have the left-hand side, the starches are nice and happy, but as we add water, in particular hot water, these starches will pull up water and those layers will start to expand until they stretch and stretch and stretch and eventually explode. That layer shears off and just like Mr. Creosote and from the, um, will explode, releasing all of the soluble starches inside of them. So I think this makes a difference. I've done both, I, I've tried both. Would I start here doing this sort of protocol? Absolutely not, but it does have an impact. I think it does have an impact when it comes to, you know, if you're trying to dry the beer out, make it a bit lighter, maybe give a bit more body to it without adding sweetness, this can have a benefit to it. 
Now, another common technique you see is 90 to 120 minute minute boils. Now, we already talked about 90 minute boils. If you're making a lager, I'd absolutely recommend you do 90 minute boils at least, at least. But some people then go for the 120. And why would we want to do that? Longer boils will produce cleaner beers, period. Though it might produce a little bit more of a sweeter tone, a bit more Maillard reactions, especially if you're using a direct fire kettle, which is becoming less and less common in the industry. Um, not really an issue with steam because the steam is only at, always at a 121 degrees Celsius. I cannot convert that into Fahrenheit off the top of my head, so I'm sorry if someone has a question about that. We can put it in the comments below. Um, but yeah, we, we further re when we boil for longer, we have further reduced the amount of DMS in our wort, which has some benefits to it. Now, I want to take a quick minute and just kind of go a bit further into this because I think this is something that a lot of people have misconceptions about or don't fully understand. So the question here is, first off, is doing this 120-minute boil necessary, especially the 90-minute boil? And I would say for 90 minutes, is it necessary? Absolutely, but it's I want to make it a bit cleaner. It's kind of complicated. So that before, to explain this, we got to talk a bit about your palate, not the wooden thing you, your malt comes in with your tongue and how it works. So your palate has, we're going to talk about three of them. It has a fourth, but it's not important for, for this content. Um, but it has three main, what we call thresholds or kind of zones, into, you know, sensors that can get tripped. So the first one is called an absolute or detection threshold. We then have our difference or discrimination threshold. And then we have our recognition threshold. So I want to walk a little, talk about each one. Now, your detection threshold is the minimum amount of quantity of stimulus for you to detect it. So it's kind of like if you, th you can think about it, it's not just for your palate, it's for everything associated with how you feel, touch, move within the environment. Um, like, you know, if, if, someone, if something's touching you, but it's not, it doesn't have enough pressure, you won't actually feel it. If people have done studies on this, it's, it's kind of freaky, but it works. Um, you know, if a small amount of light can be in a room, but if it's below your detection threshold, you can't tell it. If you've ever had a beer or you've ever had a, a food or something like that, or you, 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 something's wrong, something is wrong. You can't tell exactly what it is, but there's something that you don't like in the thing, but you don't know what the off flavor is. You don't know what the flavor compound is. What you were likely experiencing is a, a compound, a chemical compound that is above your detection threshold. So you can tell the thing is present, but you cannot it has not met the next threshold, which is the recognition or identification threshold, the minimum of the quantity to be able for you to name it or to categorize it, to be organized. So if you, I, this is very common with acetaldehydes, aldehydes in general, where people will taste beer like something's off. I don't know what it is. It's usually an aldehyde in general, but it can be a handful of different things. It can it could be any any flavor compound. If you ever had a product or a, a beer, a wine, a spirit, a curry, some sort of food where like there's, a, there's an ingredient present here. I just, I can't tell you what it is, but I like it or I don't like it. You are tasting a compound that is above your detection threshold, but below your recognition threshold. We then have a third one, which is your difference threshold, which essentially is how much, how much more or less does the stimuli have to be when it, from an intensity standpoint for you to, your palate to notice it. Not really, it's not super important for us to talk about today, but important, useful. So to bring it back as to why boil for 90 minutes or 60 minutes, you may not be able to identify that your beer has DMS. The concentration of DMS in the product may not, may not have reached that recognition or identification threshold, but that does not mean that it has not been detected. So when we boil for say 60 minutes, this is very common for 60 minute boils for pilsners or lagers. You can hit the detection threshold where it's like, yeah, there's something, there's, a, there's an off flavor funkiness in this product. I don't know what it is. It could be acetaldehyde, it could be diacetyl, it could be some fusels, it could be a whole bunch of different things. It could be DMS. But you don't know because it has not reached this recognition th threshold. If you boil for 90 minutes and you're still getting a little bit of kind of some sort of undis undiscernible off flavor, try boiling for longer. Try going to that 120. See if it cleans up. If it cleans up, you are, you are tasting something, you tell you, you're tasting DMS that is above your detection threshold, but below your recognition, which is a common off flavor method. It's a com common off flavor you find in lagers, and a lot of people get themselves in this trap where they can't identify what the off flavor is. So they just kind of accept it, but you can still fix it. And you should still tr still strive to, strive to th fix it. So that's why uh, we either want to do 90 or 120 minute boils. 
Now, another edge case for this, uh, under pressure. Pressurized lager fermentations are all the rage. It's very hot right now, uh, which is actually pretty appropriate because you ferment hotter, these, these lagers hotter. The idea behind a pressurized lager fermentation is that it's slow, pressure will slow down the rate of fermentation. Now, this is help, there to help mimic the, the same phenomena we see when we have a colder fermentation. Colder fermentations will slow the rate of fermentation. Pressure will also slow the rate of fermentation. So both of them should, in, due to this, decrease flavor compound production, you know, make the beer cleaner. If you do not have good glycol control or cannot hold, or you're having issues holding the beer at, say, 10C or 6C, again, sorry for not having this in Fahrenheit, uh, this, this can be very, very beneficial. Now, it is not a clean one-to-one -one replacement, and I want to just kind of give you a data set to help figure this out. Uh, now, if you do want to go into more information on this, we do have a blog post on it, uh, homebrew experiment, crispy under pressure. If you want to dig into this, you can. Um, I'd recommend you, you go through it. But to give you an idea as to what the flavor compounds produce or the differences between a traditional lager, so a cold fermentation versus a pressurized fermentation, there's some GC data, gas chromatography data you can find out there. And as a generality, what we see is that the ester profiles and with a pressure fermentation, a higher temperature pressurized fermentation are higher. Banana is higher, fruity floral tones are higher, apple pear tones are about, about flat. Technically, tropical or pineapple tones are up, but you know, indiscernibly. Uh, the flavor compounds are not, they're not exactly the same, but they are still cleaner than as relative to if you had fermented this, this beer, you know, at 20 degrees Celsius. So it'll help you get you there for pressurized fermentations, but it's not going to replicate all the same flavor compounds we associate with, log, you know, cold fermented lagers. Now, if you want to do this commercially, what you need to do is you need to get a spunding valve, which is what you see here on the right hand side. If you want to dig more into that, you can find a lot of different manufacturers outside in the in industry, sorry, suppliers who can sell these things. But I did want to just emphasize this point. So as a final thought um, on this topic, this is the summary of it. I quite enjoyed both the beers, but if I had to pick one, I'd take the, I'd take the pressure fermented beer. It just felt cleaner, crisper, and closer to a classic German Pilsner. This is based on a, uh, a crispy fermentations, by the way. The atmospheric pressure beer was still a great beer, and I'm sure I'll be able to drink, mul drink multiples. The vast majority of the testers who correctly selected the odd, beer, uh, sorry, the odd beer out agreed with us. Again, this was a very small sample size, so take, take any, any preference with a grain of salt. I'd be curious to see if there are any objective differences between these two beers. Relative to a normal atmospheric standard condition, 20 degrees Celsius lager, sorry, uh, fermentation, pressure fermentations do typically become cleaner, lighter, all the things more lager-like. Not exactly the same, but more lager-like. Now, there's lots of different places we can go for this. We're about just over 30 minutes on this thing, so we're going to try and keep this a bit shorter. Uh, if you want us to talk about any of these other topics, like how can I make clear beer fast, water quality in lager brewing, malt selection, hot side aeration, dial-in war aeration for lagers, fan needs for lagers, let us know. These can be some, uh, some Q&A if you put them in the comments section, which might spawn some more videos or another talk. Let us know what you want to know. That's what we're here. Now, my general approach for making lagers, if you want to go Nathaniel Ferguson's ruling principles for brewing when it comes to lager manufacturing, not just lagers, actually, uh, for everything. My first rule, it is better to make boring beer than bad beer. And I'd want, I, I can't emphasize this one strongly enough. Um, bad beer sucks. Boring beer sucks way less. It is far easier for your sales team, your sales reps, anyone associated with the silver product to sell something that is boring than it is to taste, sell something that has obvious off flavors to it. So if you are trying to make lagers or you just want to really step up your game, your first goal should be to make something that is devoid of off flavors. That's where I'd start. If you have off flavors, if you have DMS, or you have kind of indescript off flavors where it's, it's you know, above that detection, but not to the recognition point, somewhere between the two, clean that stuff up first. That's where things like yeast nutrient, yeast lightning will help you a lot. That's where, you know, increased war aeration, increased fan, um, all those different things. That, that's where those boil in for 90 minutes or 120 minutes. That is where those things will help you and do a lot of the improvement. Second rule I have is you can't do it commercially or at scale, at your scale. You know, commercially for some breweries are five hex. Some breweries, it's, you know, their, their pilot system is 40. 
We work with them. They're great. We love working with them. Uh, if you can't do it at that scale, don't bother. That's just my, my general approach. So yeah, my suggestion would be make a light North American style lager without any off flavors. If you have off flavors, fix them. Add in some malt, add a try, add make it sweeter, rounder, you know, add in mash rest, maybe do decoction, maybe do spunding, but start out with just trying to make something boring that is crushable that you can move a lot of volume with. That should be your first goal, in my opinion. So this brings us to our last type, making different types of lagers. So in general, again, this is not a perfect breakdown. I'm not trying, this is a, this is a rough generality. North American style lagers uh, have, uh, of the style, not of the ones you find in North America, there are some amazing lagers that are made in European styles, made in North America. But the North American styles of lager uh, typically have minimal to no ester profile, minimal to no sulfur, pro sulfur character, good or bad, um, almost no off flavors, uh, with the exception of discount brands or things like that, or the weird edge cases with rolling rock where they want some DMS. Not my thing, but some people like it. Not my thing. A drier finish, higher carbonation, less foam. If I think of this like the flavor knob, like if, if it's a guitar and you have a flavor, like how, how high is the flavor, how high is the volume, it's like a three or a four. Where the continental style lagers, you know, low to moderate ester profile, low to mo moderate sulfur profile, no off flavors, more malt tones, more biscuit, bready, bread custs, things like that. Um, medium to high carbonation, much more foam on these beers. The flavor knob is kind of like stuck in the four to six range. They're more intense. They, have, they got more going on. Now, in either case, 11's right out. It's kind of fun. Now, a few things we need to keep in mind. This comes from making certain types of uh, these beers. One of the biggest things we have to work with or with loggers is diacetyl or diacetyl reduction. Now, what you see here is the time required for diacetyl be, to be reuptaken, to be broken down. And what you can see is that as we ferment colder, green, you know, the, the more green the color is, the longer this, the colder the, the beer is, the longer this process is required, which sucks. The hotter we ferment, the faster diacetyl is reuptaken. So what we, what we end up seeing is we see a lot of the European style breweries, the Germans, the you know, Czechs, Austrians, they keep these beers cold, but for a longer period of time, longer period of time. While the North American style manufacturers just simply increase the temperature. Chalk the temperature up, get the diacetyl broken down as fast as they, as they possibly can. Why do one over the other? You're probably asking. There's reasons for it. So what common techniques are associated with North American style light lager? Now, North American style light lager typically invent a technique that I'm sure most people who listen to this are, are familiar with, which is called the free rise. A free rise ha is where you, at near the end of fermentation, rise the beer one to two degrees Celsius, sometimes over several days, uh, but you let the beer rise up in temperature near the end. This helps clean up diacetyl, acetaldehyde, flash off some sulfur compounds that we don't want. Sometimes you want them. In this case, we don't want them. Helps clean the beer up. Now, we also have a very big imp impact on strain selection here. Now, strains needed for North American style light lagers typically require less zinc and typically require just less everything. This is useful for them, but they're also usually uh, not exactly very flavor expressive. There are some lager yeast out there that are incredibly flavor expressive. Most of the European ones are more flavor expressive. North American style light lockers are neutral. They want nothing. They're just, they're just workhorses. They're just produced alcohol machines. And we typically for these beers want to reduce the war aeration to a minimum. We're only trying to add enough war aeration to what is required for these things to not have off flavors. Now, I want to take a little tangent on this. Uh, if you start looking to old school textbooks, like old school lager brewing textbooks and things like that, you will find some uh, deviation on this. You'll, you'll find some difference of opinions on, on this. And I, I want to take a quick moment on this. Um, if you are a, like a Budweiser, a huge manufacturer of light lager in the U S and you increased your war aeration rate, this actually has some negatives. It has some negatives for you because the more oxygen we provide, the less ethanol we're going to get at the end. If, if our high gravity beer, because most Budweiser's fermented at it, you know, to seven and a half, seven percent ABV, and then watered back down. Not a bad thing. It's very useful. It's one of the things that makes this beer style what it is. Um, but if we, if we, if our beer is say seven point five to seven point six, we've lost a lot of volume 
for the manufacturing of this product. Now, if we're a craft brewery, though, and we go, we add a bit more wort aeration, we're going to have just some, as you saw in the graph earlier, faster fermentation times, also healthier yeast cells, maybe some more flavor expressive yeast. These can be, these can be benefits for a large scale macro setting. That's what we're talking about here. Reducing wort aeration to a minimum. That's the point. Now, if you look at some textbooks that are focused on flavor versus other ones that are focused on throughput, you're going to see differences. Just keep that in mind when you're reading. Now, a modern fermentation will look something like this. So we have our temperature in blue, and we have our gravity is in orange. If you want to pause and take a look at it, you can do that right now. It's the beauty of YouTube. We see our temperature. We started here around you know, 12 or so. Increases. Hold, held for most of it. Then once we get you know, about halfway through, we ramp the temperature up. In this case, it got near 20. Held for a few days. Once we started seeing stable gravities, we then start cooling down. And the whole thing's finished in about, you know, four days, five days. Very high throughput flavor compound, no, minimal flavor compound production, but high throughput lager making methodology. It's kind of beautiful. Now, there's a few benefits to this. The free rise is going to have some positives. It's going to help us flash them off some acetaldehyde. It's going to also increase diacetyl reuptake. But an important one as well is that as we increase the temperature, we're also going to decrease the solubility of sulfur. And this is one thing that people don't really talk about. So to get into this a little bit, uh, I'm sure almost everyone watching this has tried to use a bright tank to carbonate beer. Or you know, if you're, the, if you're someone at home, you've tried, probably tried to force carbonate beer, as I'm sure we're all aware. And if you weren't, here's an important tip. Uh, gases are more soluble at colder temperatures. The colder the, the colder the temperature, the more soluble gases are into water. Sulfur is also a gas. Sulfur is also a gas. So when we keep our wort cold the entire way through fermentation, that sulfurous gas is going to be more, more soluble. It's going to be more stable. It's going to stay inside the solution. But as we increase the temperature in this free rise, we are also flashing off a lot of sulfur compounds, positive and negative, because we have decreased their solubility due to the increased, wort, uh, increased beer temperatures. Fun fact. That's why this works. That's why it works. It's also why North American style light lagers have almost no sulfur profile because we've, we've stripped them all off due to increased fermentation temperatures. No right solutions, only trade-offs. So with that, what's needed for continental style, ooh, continental style lager? Now in general, these things are fermented colder, 10 to 12 C. Again, we're trying to keep some of those flavor compounds. We want some of those sulfur compounds in this case. Um, you want less off flavors though, off flavors though. So we have to have a stronger emphasis on making sure these off flavors are not produced. Important part here. For the North American style light lager, we can do a free rise, get rid of our acetaldehyde, get rid of our diacetyl, get rid of our sulfur. Not a problem. For the European styles, they're a bit more complicated and we have to have more emphasis on how do we stop the creation of these comp of these off flavors. And on top of this, we also want more esters, and this, but this is mainly achieved via strain selection. Now, how does this work? So here's a traditional lager fermentation. So in this case, it started at six, let allowed to free rise a little bit up to nine. Again, much colder. We hold at nine. We then go down a bit colder, down a bit colder, down a bit colder. They then, in this case, added a Krausen or a bit, you know, fresh wort to help, help carbonate the beer as they probably moved it into a secondary vessel. But you'll notice the fermentation here is slower. It is more pragmatic. They're looking for a stable decrease in gravity throughout the entire thing. And so they're using temperature to help help modulate that. And where before the whole thing was finished in like 96 hours, we're looking 114, 180, a much longer period of time for fermentation to occur. And that's why we get the flavor, some of the flavor compounds we associate with the style of beer. That's it. That's not the only way to do it. Here's another one. Uh, this is a fermentation of a Czech lager. So as yeast was pitched, this was in Fahrenheit. Yeast cells are pitched, 45 was maintained, a little bit of a free rise up to 10, 65, and then a slow ramp down the entire fermentation. There are different ways to ferment lagers. There are different ways. You know, the, the Germans have different ways than the Czechs, which have different ways than the Danes. Everyone has a different ways of for managing fermentation. There's no right or wrong way. Each way is just going to give you different attributes, different properties, different things you're looking for. 
And that's about it for today. I, ho I hope you guys learned a bunch. I hope you guys went through kind of different elements or different things you can work with. Again, if, you're, if I were to try to emphasize a few things for this talk, I would try to emphasize this. You try to make a good, try to make a, a boring beer first, a boring, high quality drinking beer first. If you are trying to improve something, and, uh, uh, so your current lagers, you, you have off flavors of some way, shape, or form, the two things I would do would be add some sort of yeast nutrient, ideally yeast lightning, but if not, there are other high quality nutrients out there too. And if you're not doing so already, boil for 90 minutes. Those things will help do a huge amount of good for your product and improve the quality of lagers that you're producing. So I hope you find help. Hope you found this useful. Uh, if you want more more information, we have tons of resources out there for you. Uh, we our knowledge base has over 80 entries in it, over 80 um, you know articles or different sorts on there. We have over 50 hours worth of content on our YouTube page, all about fermentation, how to improve your quality of beer. We we're posting about 24 blogs at minimum per year. Uh, we got lots of different content out there for you. So if you're uh, if you have some questions, have we, I strongly encourage you to look into that stuff. I thank you all for your time and uh, happy brewing. And I hope you hope you learned a bunch. Have a good one, everyone. Cheers.